All right. This was last semester's exam, the spring 2014 exam. Now, here's the important deal. The exam is going to give, be given to you guys in three parts. The first part is a multiple choice no calculator. It's somewhere between 12 and 15 questions is what they typically do. And you have exactly one hour to do this in. But honestly, most folks get this part done in about 30 minutes. But again, no one gets to use their calculator until your professor, whether it's me or some other professor, is going to give you the official word that everybody has turned in part number one and now everyone's allowed to use their calculator. As long as one student has part number one out there in your particular classroom, no one's allowed to use the calculator until everybody is done with part number one. But don't worry, part twos and three you can use a calculator with, but most of it you can actually do without a calculator. And we're really designing this and you guys showing us what you guys know about calculus. And the other thing I want to tell you guys before I start this thing is remember this. The final exam is about competition. It's about two things. You versus this exam. Making sure that you understand this material and you knock it out of the ballpark. Making sure you know this stuff. But the other thing is this. It's you versus all the other students. It is competition. So the, the people who do the best are going to get the A's on this thing. The people who did the worst are going to fail this exam. It's all about competition. And what I mean by that is this. Let's say, for example, that you made an 80 on this exam. But if the class average was a 62, what is that going to make an 80? Is that going to be a low B or probably a high B? High B. They are going to scale it accordingly depending upon how you did versus everybody else. So it really is based upon your abilities and knowing how you guys do on this exam. So keep that in mind. So you do the best you can, and honestly, it's a sad story, but here's the story. You do the best you can and pray everybody else just bombs it. That's the way of life, because it's you versus the rest of the world. This isn't high school. This is college. It's all about competition, you versus everybody else, making sure you do better and everybody else not do as quite as well, makes you shine a lot better, okay? This is calculus at the university level. All right. Now, we've gone through lots of material this semester, but the most important thing we've gone through in Calculus 1 is the derivative. So 50% of this exam is going to be your ability to actually take a derivative. And the other aspect of this exam is your application of those derivatives. They're going to hit you hard on two different types of word problems, optimization and related rates. Keep that in mind and keep practicing how to maximize or minimize and how to do a related rate kind of a problem, okay? So let's take a look at this exam. So 8 o'clock shows up. You've already filled out the forms. You'll have to have your student ID number with you. You'll have to have your student card with you. And you have to have pencils. Only pencils are done on the exam. And you can have your calculator, but in the first part of it, no calculator. The calculators will be put underneath your desk, away from everybody. So 8 o'clock shows up. You open your test booklet. And you start with problem number one. Problem number one, this is a no calculator section. But even though you will be allowed, you will, will have to actually compute some numbers here, it's all right. Most of the numbers are going to be pretty nice. So here we go. I'm given f of x equals x cubed plus 8 over x plus 4. I want to find f prime of 2. Right off the bat, I'm supposed to take a derivative of this thing. So let me blow this up a little bit more. You guys can sit in the back there. So the first thing you want to do to any kind of problem is what? Before you take its derivative, what do you need to do? Clean it up. So f of x equals x cubed plus 8x to the negative 1 plus 4. Now let's take the derivative. What's the derivative of this thing? Well, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The derivative of 8x to the negative 1 is negative 8x to the negative 2, and the derivative of 4 is 0. But then, clean it back up again, this implies that f prime of x is equal to 3x squared minus 8 over x squared. But now I want to calculate f prime of 2, so what I'm going to do here is replace all my x's with 2's. 
This would be 3 times 2 squared minus 8 times divided by 2 squared. Clean it up. Again, no calculator, but you don't need a calculator for this. 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12 minus 2 squared is 4 and 8 divided by 4 is 2 and 12 minus 2 is 10. The answer is E. All right. Let's go to the next one. More derivatives. Now again, similar type of problem here. I got g of x is equal to x squared plus 1 quantity cubed. They want me to find g prime of 1, but before I find g prime of 1, I got to find g prime of x. What rule would you use to take rid of this thing? x squared plus 1 quantity cubed. Chain rule. Drive the outside, inside stays the same time through the inside. This would be 3 times x squared plus 1 squared. Go the outside, inside stays the same time through the inside, 2x. Now I'm going to plug in 1 and for all the x's. So g prime of 1 would be 3 times 1 squared plus 1, quantity squared, times 2 times 1. 1 squared is 1 plus 2 is 2. 2 squared is 4. So this will be 3 times 4 and 2 times 1 is 2. 3 times 2, I'm sorry, 3 times 4 is 12. And 12 times 2 is 24. So the answer is D. No calculator needed on this stuff. Now take a look at the next guy. In the next guy, you have H of X is equal to 3X minus 1 over X squared plus 1. Again, we're supposed to evaluate H prime of X. <coughs> so, straight up, once again, take a derivative. What rule would I use to take a derivative of 3X minus 1 over X squared plus 1? Close rule, drew the top times the bottom minus the top times drew the bottom all over the bottom squared. These are the forms you've got to have memorized for this exam, as well as all the other formulas. So, drew the top, it's 3 times the bottom is x squared plus 1. Minus the top, drew the top is 3, x minus 1, the top, times drew the bottom is 2x. All over the bottom, x squared plus 1. But this doesn't look like any of my answers. What does that mean? You got to clean them up. All right. Be careful because this is where most students will screw up your calculus. They'll screw up the algebra somehow. I'm going to distribute. 3 times x squared is uh, 3x squared. 3 times 1 is uh, plus 3. Here I'm going to distribute the 2x and the negative at the same time. And this will be negative. 2x times a 3x is a negative 6x squared. And a negative times a negative 1 times a 2x, a negative and negative makes it a positive plus 2x. All over my denominator, x squared plus 1 squared. So this is 3x, um, 3x squared minus 6x squared, combining like terms, is a negative 3x squared. And I have plus 2x plus 3 all over x squared plus 1 <coughs> squared. Does this look like any one of my answers? Well, I believe it does. Which one is it? Double check it. Negative 3x squared plus 2x plus 3 over x squared plus 1 quantity squared. Answer again is B. Does that make sense? Keep on going. Problem number 4. f of x is equal to e to the 2x cosine of 3x. If I want to find f prime of x, I got e to the 2x times cosine of 3x. So what's my big rule? Let me give you a hint. e to the 2x times cosine of uh, 3x. What's the rule? Product rule. Drew the first time the second plus the first time drew the second. Problem is, when you take derivative of each term, derivative of e to the 2x requires you to use the chain rule version of e, e to a function, derivative of that is e to a function times derivative of the exponent. And derivative of cosine of an angle, that's chain rule again. Derivative of the outside, inside, stay the same time, derivative of the inside. So, it's just a big combination rule. So, product rule. Derivative of e to the 2x. Well, e to the 2x is e to the 2x times derivative of the exponent, which is 2. There's derivative of the first times the second, cosine of 3x, plus the first, which is e to the 2x, times the derivative of the second. Derivative of the cosine of 3x, well, what's derivative of cosine? Negative sine is through the outside. The inside, 3x stays the same. Time, time through the inside, which is 3. Using my chain rule on that guy. Cleaning him up, 
this gives me f prime of x is equal to 2 e to the 2x cosine of 3x, a negative 3, that'll be minus 3, e to the 2x sine of 3x. Okay. Remember this, because this is what the folks that make up the old final exam like to do to you people. And what is that? When I start looking for my answers, I like it like this. Usually I put the minus guy in the back. Oh, no, they didn't do that. They did stuff worse. What do they do to these answers? Oh, one, they factored something out of it. Okay, fine, we can do that. So what did they factor out of it? So I'm going to take out an e to the 2x. That would leave me with a 2 cosine of 3x minus 3 sine of 3x. So now looking at this, and the other thing they did was they put the minus guy in the front for some strange reason. So let's double check it. It's the same thing, minus 3 sine 3x. That'll be plus 2 cosine 3x. So the answer clearly is, let's see, and you match up all the terms. Does that make sense? All right. They factored out the e to the 2x. And then they reversed the order. They put the minus 3 sine 3x up front. And they put the 2 cosine 3x in the back. Where did the 2 go back into the All right. Next problem. Let f of x be equal to the arc sine of the natural log of x. You're supposed to evaluate f prime of x. And just trying to remind you that the arc sine is also known as the sine inverse in case your professor was just one-sided and didn't give you both definitions. Arc sine, sine inverse, same thing. Well, you've got to remember your rules. So again, the reason why you do these final exams is you're going through and reminding yourself what are the basic formulas, not just the product rule, chain rule, or quotient rule, but some of the interesting forms like arc sine, arc tangent, arc secant, and all these other guys that you have to know. You know, natural log of x, root of 1 over x. There's tons of formulas you've got to have memorized here. So let's see if you guys remember, remember this guy. If y equals the arc sine of u, this is the chain rule version of it, then what is y prime going to be equal to? What's my formula for taking the derivative of sine inverse or arc sine? 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared times u prime, the derivative of the inside. So this is the chain rule version of it. Again, pure memorization, but our problem is this. We have f of x is equal to the sine inverse or arc sine of the natural log of x. So when I take my derivative, I follow my arc sine rule. It's 1 over the square root of 1 minus the function that we have inside the arc sine, which is the natural log of x squared. But then you've got to do times the derivative of the u, the inside. What's the root of natural log of x? 1 over x. And of course you want to clean this up. And this is a fraction times a fraction. So you make it one big fraction. 1 over, I'm going to put the x out front of the square root of 1 minus the natural log of x quantity squared. And so that is my answer. Which is answer which one? B. But had to go back and remember a rule. So even though they did this one was the arc sine, make sure you go back and remember the derivatives of arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, arc cotangent, arc secant, and arc cosecant, because there were six inverse trig functions as well. So the next one is this. You know, we're going to be asking you questions about the basic definition of derivative. And if you remember, there were three formulas for derivatives that you're supposed to know. There was the formula for the derivative of the function, which was this. f prime of x was equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. You know, there's certain textbooks that replace h with delta x. So it'll be f, it'll be limit as delta x approaches 0, f plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. It's the same thing. But that is the definition of derivative of a function. Derivative at a particular point, A, a had two formulas. F prime of A would also be equal to the limit as H approaches 0 of F of A plus H minus F of A all over H. But there was another version of this formula. F prime of A would be equal to the limit 
as, a, as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. There were three versions of the derivative formula. Two of them were the definition of derivative at a particular point called the slope of the tangent line. And this is your definition of derivative of a function, which gives you a functional derivative. They want a derivative of a point, x equals 2, so it's either the first one or the second one. And I see a bunch of h's over here. If that's the case, it's got to be this form right here. But my a was equal to 2, so I'm just going to rewrite this. So f prime of 2 would be equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 2 plus h <coughs> minus f of 2 over h. This would be my definition using this form here. And which one of these guys is my answer? And let's see here. f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 all over h. Limit as h goes to 0. It's got to be e. Immediately with the h thing here, I know that a and b cannot be the right because h is going to 2. I know the definition as it goes to 0. So the answer is either c, d, or e. Just take your time and figure out which one it's going to be. Does that make sense? But I thought I'd write down all three of them because you never know what they're going to give you guys. Take a look at number seven. Number seven asks you to... You're looking at the graph of g of x is equal to 1 half x to the fourth minus 2x cubed minus 9x squared. What is the interval that is concave down? Is concave down on the interval which one of these guys? Well, they're talking about concavity. What does concavity deal with? Second derivative. So, first thing I'm going to do is take the first derivative of this thing. 4 times a half is uh, 2x cubed minus 6x squared minus 18x, and I'll keep on going. Now I'm going to do for the second derivative would be 6x squared minus 12x minus 18. Before I can figure out intervals of concavity, i got to find the inflection numbers. What am I going to do to find inflection numbers? I'm going to take my second derivative and set him equal to 0 and solve. This is going to give me g double prime when I factor it. I can factor out a 6. That leaves me with x squared minus 2x minus 3. And then... I can factor it some more because of the quadratic. <coughs> x squared minus 2x minus 3 factors into what? x minus 3 times x plus 1. I set it equal to 0, and I set each factor, x minus 3 equal to 0, and the other factor has an x in it, x plus 1 equals 0. 6 is a constant, so I don't worry about him at all. And then I just solve. I get x equals 3 x equals negative 1. These are my possible inflection numbers. How do I figure out intervals of concavity? Anytime you hear the word intervals, what are you going to do? Draw a number line. And on the number line, in order, put your inflection numbers on there. Negative 1 is smaller, so that comes first, then comes 3. And this is a second derivative number line, and we're going to do a test on this. So pick a number less than negative 1. Good choice. So I'm going to plug it into my second derivative, negative 2. Pick a number between negative 1 and 3 and use your brain. Good choice. And pick a number bigger than 3. 4. But remember, with this, you're not allowed to use a calculator. And since you're not allowed to use a calculator, there are tricks of the trade on how to do this stuff efficiently so I can get my answer. So, here we go. I'm going to plug in negative 2. Unless it's 0, I'm going to plug it into the factored version of my second derivative instead of the quadratic version of my second derivative. It'll be easier to calculate because you don't care about the number. All you care about is the sign. So, when I plug in f, or in this case g, we grab a function here, we call it g, g of negative 2 here, this will be 6 times Negative 2 minus 3 is negative 5, and negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. Well, I can crunch this out. What do I get? 6 times negative 5 times negative 1. Well, I don't care what the number is, but I'll go ahead and give it to you. That's six, negative 5 times negative 1 is positive 5, times 6 is 30. And it's positive, so everybody in that interval is positive, which tells me it's concave up there. Now, if I'm going to plug in 0, 
I can plug it into the factored form, but that's the only one that's easier to plug into in the fold out form. Plugging in zero into 6x squared minus 12x minus 18 is going to give me what? Negative 18, which means it's negative. And g of 4, I'm going to plug in 4. I'll plug it into the factor form because I don't have a calculator. That'll be 6 times 4 minus 3 is 1 times 4 plus 1, which is 5. 6 times 1 times 5 is back to 30 again. So what interval is this thing decreasing? Oh, it's, oh, it's giving an idea. It's concave down. It's where the second derivative is negative. So it's concave up between negative infinity and 1. It's concave down between negative 1 and 3. It's concave up between 3 and infinity. They want to know where it is concave down at. So my answer is between negative 1 and 3. And the answer is C. But honestly, right off the beginning, once I set it equal to 0 and got 1 and 3, I knew that answers D and E could not be the possible answers. The answer was either A, B, or C. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you get those test points, you always come back to the second derivative and plot the original equation? No, no. When I want the I actual plot the point, I'm going to put it into the original equation. That's going to give me a y-coordinate. If I'm owning intervals of increase and decrease, I plug my test values into the first derivative. And if I want concavity, I plug my test values into the second derivative and worry about the sign. Concavity is second derivative. Increase and decrease is first derivative. And if I needed the y coordinate to plot the point, I plug it into the original function. Let's take a look at this next guy. Take the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 7x minus 18 over x minus 2. What's the first rule of limits? Chapter 1, page 1. What's the first thing you can do with limits? Plug in a number. This is going to give me, when I plug it in, 2 squared plus 7 times 2 minus 18 over 2 minus 2. Cleaning this guy up, this is going to give me, well, let's see here. 2 squared is 4. 7 times 2 is 14. 4 and 14 is 18. Minus 18 is 0. And 2 minus 2 is 0. Now, this is a cumulative final exam you guys are dealing with. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. You can go back and do chapter 1 type of stuff and factor it because it's 0 over 0. Do algebra or whatever. But the fact is, you've gone through chapter 3.6, 3.7 here. You've got L'Hopital's rule down, which is a faster way to do limits, as long as it's 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. So I would do L'Hopital's rule on this guy, and that would be equal to the limit as x approaches 2 of the derivative of the top, which is 2x plus 7, divided by the derivative of the bottom. The denominator is going to be 1. And now I back and plug in 2. This will be 2 times 2 plus 7 over 1. And 2 times 2 is 4, plus 7 is 11, divided by 1 is 11. The answer is 11. The answer is E. Does that make sense? I could have factored the numerator and then canceled the x plus minus 2's out and then plug in the number. That would have been fine too, but L'Hopital's rule just does it a lot faster. Speaking of that, the next one, number 9. Evaluate the limit as x approaches infinity of 3x minus 2 over x squared plus 4x plus 4. First rule is I'm going to plug in infinity. Well, when I do that, I'm going to get infinity over infinity. However, there's two things you could do to this problem. I could do <coughs> L'Hopital's rule. Because L'Hopital's rule works with either infinity over infinity or 0 over 0. And that would be the limit as x approaches infinity of drew the top, which is 3, over drew the bottom, which is 2x plus 4. When I plug in infinity here, it'll be 3 divided by 2 times infinity plus 4, which is 3 over infinity. And when the infinity is on the bottom, what do you get? Zero. Zero. But honestly, you could do that, and I wanted to show the work on this particular one. However, I didn't have to do all that stuff. If I remember some of my college algebra days, High school algebra 2, called the horizontal isomptote theorem. Horizontal, horizontal isomptote theorem focused on, focused on the degree of the top or the degree of the bottom. When you take the limit as x approaches either infinity or negative infinity, and you have a polynomial over a polynomial, when the degree of the top is bigger, the answer is either infinity or negative infinity. When the degree of the bottom is bigger, the answer is always 0. And if their degree of the top equals degree of the bottom, the answer is going to be the ratio of the leading coefficient. So you can look at these things and tell what they are. 
But because the degree of the bottom is bigger, 2, than the degree of the top, which is 1, I knew the answer was 0 even before I started. And you could have done that because this is multiple choice test. You don't have to be so elaborate with showing your work. On the free response, you've got to be over elaborate in showing your real work and be neat. Now let's evaluate this limit. The limit as x approaches 0 of e to the 2x minus 1 over x. Now they're telling me to use L'Hopital's rule, but it's kind of ridiculous for them to tell me this because first rule of limits is plugging a number. This will be e to the 2 times 0 minus 1 over 0. 2 times 0 is 0, and e to the 0 is 1, so 1 minus 1 is 0 over 0. So it's 0 over 0, which screams I'm going to have to do L'Hopital's rule anyway. It's the limit as x approaches 0 of. Drew the top. What's the root of e to the 2x? <coughs> e to the 2x times 2. Chain rule version of e. e to a function is e to a function times root of the exponent. Divided by, drew the denominator. What's the root of x? 1. And then replug in your number. That's would be e to the 2 times 0 times 2 over 1. But e 2 times 0 is 0. And e to the 0 is 1. So this gives me pretty much 2 over 1, which equals 2. The answer is 6. Does that make sense? All right. But here's the problem that's going to be on your test. <coughs> right here, in taking all the derivative stuff, all of a sudden they give you what kind of problem? <coughs> Anti-derivative. Don't get the rules backwards. Left brain, right brain. They're setting you up for calculus two. Calculus two deals with the anti-derivative or integral. So, they're asking for an, an antiderivative. So, they want me to integrate 3 over x squared plus the cosine of x dx. This is your antiderivative or integral. But remember, John's fundamental calculus. It applied for you in calculus 1. It's going to apply again in calculus 2. It is better to clean up your algebra before you do your calculus than afterwards. I don't like this 3 over x squared. All I've got is basic rules about x to a power. So this would be, cleaning it up, the integral of 3x to the negative 2 plus the cosine of x dx. <coughs> when you integrate, constants hold over. You add 1 over add 1. That will be x to the negative 1 over negative 1. Plus, now don't get it confused because I guarantee you the answer is going to be there and the negative sign of that answer is going to be there. What is the integral or antiderivative of the cosine of x? In other words, what function out there when I take derivative of it do I get cosine of x? Sine of x. And the way I have it memorized and I try to get my students to memorize it is this. When I take derivative of cosine of x, it's negative sine of x. When you go back the other way, you'll get the same thing but change the sign. So derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. Therefore, the integral of cosine of x is positive sine of x. There it is, positive sine of x. And don't forget... No bounds on this thing, so we have to put the old plus C for the constant of integration thing here. But the last thing you want to do here is clean it up. This will be 3 divided by negative 1 is negative 3 over x negative 1 means x on the bottom plus the sine of x plus C. And so which one is my answer going to be? Negative 3 over x plus sine of x plus C. No, the answer is D. Does that make sense? Does that lose you anywhere? All right. Another ant general antiderivative problem. Antiderivative means you're going to integrate the integral of 2x times x plus 1 dx. But if you look at this thing, this is not a rule that you have memorized. There's only like 13 rules of antiderivatives you're supposed to have memorized. This isn't one of them. We don't have product rules and quotient rules for antiderivatives. But you do have this, John's fundamental rule calculus. What's John's fundamental rule calculus? Clean it up first. So before I can integrate this guy or find the antiderivative of this guy, I am going to distribute, get myself into a nice polynomial with nice terms. This would be the integral of 2x squared plus 2x dx. 2 is a constant, leave it alone. Now take your antiderivative, add 1 <coughs> over add 1. The integral of x squared is x, add 1, 3 cubed over 3, plus, that's understood to be a 1 power here, 2 holds over. The integral of x to the first is x squared over 2 
plus C for your constant integration. Cleaning them up here, the twos cancel. This leaves you with 2 thirds x cubed plus x squared plus C, which is which answer? Pretty much all the answers are D. It was a great test. All right, does that make sense? Lose you anywhere. All right? And then all of a sudden they threw this one at you. Not really calculus, but we actually covered this in calculus before we did the uh, derivative of inverses and stuff like that. So go back and remember those forms. Suppose that f of x is 2 e to the x plus 1. Then f is invertible, is an invertible function. Find the formula for its inverse. And I just want to go through the steps on how do I find an inverse. How do you find an inverse function? Step 1, you've got to make sure the function is 1 to 1. So the first thing you want to do is graph this guy. Remember, no calculators, but I can graph this without a calculator. What does e to the x look like? That's my classic exponential graph that grows up. Times 2 stretches out by a factor of 2, plus 1 shifts it up 1. So this thing is going to look like, shift it up 1 unit here, it's going to look like this, and it's an exponential growth graph. There's my e to the x times 2, which is stretched out by a factor of 2, plus 1 shifted it up 1. But you can clearly see it is one to one by the horizontal line test. Only one to one functions have inverse functions. This guy is going to have an inverse. Step number two is switch the function from f of x to y. So you get y equals 2 e to the x plus 1. Step number three on finding inverses is this switch the x and y coordinate. That's what gets inverses. The independent becomes a dependent and vice versa. This is going to give you x is equal to 2e to the y plus 1. Now, solve for y. Well, my, my y is in the exponent of an e, so I've got to get the e by himself. So my first move is I'm going to subtract 1. This gives me x minus 1 equals 2e to the y. Then I'm going to divide by 2 on both sides to get the e to the y by himself. This gives me x minus uh, 1, excuse me, x minus 1 divided by 2 equals e to the y. And then what kills off E's? Take the natural log of both sides and don't forget your parentheses there. That cancels. That gives me Y equals the natural log of X minus 1 divided by 2. And the last thing you do is replace Y with your inverse function. This guy was called F. So this thing is going to be called F inverse of X, which is equal to the natural log of X minus 1 divided by 2. Which is which answer? Yeah, what a surprise. It's D again. Does that make sense? Don't lose you guys anywhere. All right? But you will notice I'm already finished with part number two. And honestly, it takes about, it, I got started a little late because of the computer issues here, but honestly, it took about 30, 35 minutes. And remember, I explained every problem that I did, and it took me 35 minutes. So most folks are finished with this section in about 30 plus minutes. How long do you have on this section? One hour. At most, one hour. Because at the end of one hour, we're going to call for this section. Everybody has to turn this section in. So right now, I've still got about 25 minutes left of my exam time, and I'm, not, and I'm still not allowed to have the calculator. I will have part number two and part number three right there with me. What am I going to do? Well, I've seen students sit there and just humbly wait for the time, the clock to tick on until we're allowed to use a calculator. Well, you're wasting your time and my time, and I'm going to tell you right now, most of this exam you can do without a calculator. Don't stop. Turn in part one. Get, get rid of it. You're done with it. Go on to part two. Even though I can't have a calculator, that's okay. Eventually, I'll be allowed to, but I, I will do the problem to a point where if I have to have a calculator, I will stop and go on to the next problem until I'm, until I'm given the word calculator, go grab your calculator. Take a look at this problem. I don't need a calculator for this guy. f of x equals x squared times g of x. Suppose that g of 2 equals 3 and g prime of 2 is equal to negative 1. Evaluate f prime of 2. So before I can find f prime of 2, I've got to find f prime of x. f of x is equal to x squared times g of x. So to find f prime of x, what rule do I have to use? Product rule. Draw the first time the second plus the first time draw the second. Draw the first. Derivative of x squared is 2x. Draw the first times the second g of x 
plus the first x squared times the other second g prime of x. Now, there's my derivative, but what is it? Nope, more of a hoop to jump through. They don't want f prime of x. They want f prime of 2. So what am I going to do? I'm going to plug in 2 for all the x's. Now, let's plug this stuff in. I have 2 times 2, but then I got g of 2. What's g of 2 equal to? 3 plus 2 squared. I can clean that up. That's 4 times g prime of 2. What's g prime of 2 equal to? g prime of 2 is negative 1. Does that make sense? So this is equal to 2 times 2, which is 4, times 3 is 12, plus 4 times negative 1, which makes it a minus 4. So what's my answer? 8. <laughs> Still answer D. There you go. Don't worry. Your exam won't be that nice that all the answers are D. The answers on your exam will all be B. I don't know. I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, so whoever made up the exam didn't do the pro proper checking the answers and making sure they rotate them around a little bit. They just made up the exam, and somehow the graders, never, the, the readers of the exam didn't quite catch the fact that like most of the answers were D on this exam. But that's all right. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. Trust me, they'll mix up yours all over the place. All right, let's take a look at number two here. Still no calculator. I still got another 15 minutes to go. F of x equals x squared plus 1 if x is less than 1, 3 of x equals 1, and 3x minus 1 if x is greater than 1. We want to evaluate... The limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. Remember the definition of a full limit. A full limit exists when the limit from the left is equal to the limit from the right. So this would be the limit as x approaches 1 from below. And I'm going to have to set that equal to the limit as x approaches 1 from above. That's how a full limit exists. When I'm taking the limit as x approaches 1 from below, which piece of my piecewise function do I get to use, top, medium, or bottom? Because x is slightly less, going to 1 from below 1, or slightly less than 1, I get to plug it into the x squared plus 1. <coughs> and if I'm taking the limit as x approaches 1 from the plus side, I'm slightly bigger than 1. Which piece of my piecewise function do I get to use if I'm bigger than 1? 3x minus 1. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to evaluate this guy, and I'm going to check to see if it's equal to this guy. If it's equal to, the limit exists and it'll be that number. If it is not equal to, what is my answer? Does not exist. So here we go. First rule of limits is plug in a number. This will be 1 squared plus 1. 1 squared is 1 plus 1 is 2. So I get 2 for the left limit. Plugging in on the right limit here, the limit as x approaches 1 from above, of 3x minus 1. Plug it in, I get 3 times 1 minus 1. That gives me 3 minus 1, which is equal to... Two. The limit from the left equals the limit from the right. Therefore, your full limit must be 2. The answer is C now. Yay. Does that make sense? Just reminding you of your limit definitions. All right, number 3 here. Suppose that f is a differentiable function such that f of 1 is equal to 5 and f prime of x is less than or equal to 2 for all x's. Okay? Use the mean value theorem to decide what is the largest possible value of f of 4. This one right here, we had the statistics on this, exam, on this particular question was interesting. Uh, basically, we had a, a very, what we call a uniform distribution. The same number of people picked A as picked B as picked C as picked D as picked E. Basically, you guessed on this one. Why? Because they put through the words mean value theorem and people started to throw up and convulse and off over that theorem. All right. So you've got to go back and remember Rolle's theorem and mean value theorem. What is the mean value theorem? Mean value theorem says that given a continuous differentiable function, <coughs> there's going to exist a C inside your open interval between A and B such that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Okay. 
We're trying to calculate what f of 4 is. So there's the question. What is f of 4 going to be equal to at most? And that's a question mark right there. Okay? What is that guy going to be equal to? Well, I'm given f of 1 is equal to 5. And I'm given the derivative is less than or equal to 2. So I've got a maximum value on my derivative. Okay? So, if I look at this thing, I'm going to start using these numbers. F of 4 and F of 1. That's going to go into, remember, here's your formula for the mean value theorem. So this is going to be F of 4 minus F of 1. That automatically tells me that my B has got to be 4 and my A is going to have to be 1. Because that's what's inside my parentheses. Okay? And now, what is the de der derivative going to be? B, what is this F prime of C equal to? Well, F prime of C is less than or equal to 2, right? So the largest possible value would be where the derivative is the greatest. Where's the derivative greatest at on this thing? 2. Because of this right here, the greatest is at 2. I'm going to plug in 2 in for my derivative, F of C. And you'll notice that it becomes an algebra problem. I got 2 equals F of 4 minus F of 1 over 4 minus 1 using my mean slope formula. I know what f of 4 is. What's f, I'm just, I know what f of 1 is. What's f of 1 equal to? 5. I'm trying to find f of 4. So this is going to give me 2 is equal to f of 4 minus 5 over 4 minus 1, which is 3. It becomes an algebra question. Solve for f of 4. I'm going to multiply both sides by 3. This is going to cancel. I'm going to get 6 is equal to f of 4 minus 5. And then I'm going to add 5 to both sides. And I'm going to get f of 4 to be the biggest value is going to be 6 plus 5, which is 11. The answer is actually A. It's 11. Does that make sense? Again, the reason why you want to do not more than just this exam, make sure this is the exam is not the only one you guys cover, because we can't put everything on every exam. So you want to do multiple exams to kind of go through and keep your formula list going in terms of what you've done and uh, what things you're going to have to have memorized. Mean value theorem is one of them. All right, let's take a look at this next guy. Suppose that the derivative of a function f is given by f prime of x is equal to x squared times x minus 1 times x minus 2. Which of the following is correct? Note the statements are about the original function and not the derivative. The function has a local maximum at x equals 0. The function has a local minimum at x equals 0. The function has a local maximum at x equals 2. The function has a local minimum at x equals 2. The function has a local minimum at x equals 1. Well, they're talking about maxes and mins. Well, before I can figure out who's a max, who's a min, I've got to find the critical numbers. How do I find critical numbers? I take my derivative, which was given to me, x squared times x minus 1 times x minus 2, and I'm going to set it equal to 0. Okay? Now, when I set something that has been multiplied equal to 0, that's like setting each factor equal to 0. That tells me when I take the square root of both sides, x equals 0. When I uh, add 1 to both sides, I get 1. Add 2 to both sides, I get 2. I got three critical numbers, 0, 1, and 2. Which one are going to be relative extrema, max min points? All of them, none of them, one of them, I don't know. And if you do have extrema, which one's maximum, which one's minimum? The only way you're going to be able to tell, and since you got the first derivative, is use the intervals of increase and decrease off the first derivative, because of here's the deal. If I'm increasing and then I decrease, what kind of point does that make it? Maximum. If I decrease and then increase, what kind of point is that guy? Minimum. If I increase and increase some more, what's that? Nothing. It's not a maximum or a minimum. It just, you go up, you stop for a second, you go up some more. That doesn't make maxes or mins. You actually have to change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing back to increasing. That was called the first derivative test. But to be able to test this thing is, I'm going to do intervals of increase and decrease. So now, 
I'm going to sit here and plug my numbers on my number line. X equals 0, X equals 1, and X equals 2. And I'm going to choose some test values into this thing to test whether I'm increasing or decreasing in each part of my intervals. Pick a number less than 0. I choose negative 1. Pick a number between 0 and 1. I choose 0.5. Pick a number between 1 and 2. I choose 1.5. And pick a number bigger than 2. I choose 3. Now by this time, I may have made the announcement that you are allowed to use a calculator. If not, you don't have to do a calculator in this problem. All you got to do is plug in the numbers and figure out what the sign is. You can do that without a calculator, but just be careful. Or if it bothers you not to have a calculator on plugging numbers into it, then I'll go on to the next problem until I am told that I can use a calculator. Then I'll come back to this problem. Does that make sense? So personally on this one, I'm going to just show you guys how to use it without a calculator in a couple of them. If I plug in negative 1, Plugging in here, I'm going to get negative 1 squared, right over here, negative 1 squared, negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2, and negative 1 minus 3, I'm sorry, minus 2 is negative 3. I can do that without a calculator. What's negative 1 quantity squared? What's negative 2 times negative 3? Positive 6 times 1 is positive 6. So I can actually do this without a calculator. Everybody's positive, so that's positive. Now I'm going to plug in 0.5. Now let's see what you guys know about this one. Plugging in 0.5 into my derivative, 0.5 squared is 0.25. 0.5 minus 1 is negative 0.5. 0.5 minus 2 is negative 1.5. Now I know this is a bunch of decimals, but I don't care. What's the sign of it? What is 0.25 times a negative 0.5 times a negative 1.5? Positive some crappy decimal. But I don't care what the number is. All I care is the sign. It's positive, right? So I continue to be positive. I stopped at zero, and then I kept being positive. That makes zero neither a max nor a min. I went up, I stopped, and went up some more. Now let's go to plugging in 1.5. When I plug it in, I'm going to get 1.5 squared times 1.5 minus 1 is 0.5, and I'm going to get 1.5 minus 2, which is negative 0.5. What is 0.5 squared times 0.5 times a negative 0.5? What kind of number is it? Negative. So that interval, everybody's negative. So I'm decreasing between 1 and 2. Now I'm going to plug in 3. Plugging in 3 over here, I got 3 squared, which is 9. I can do that kind of math. 3 minus 1, which is 2, and I got 3 minus 2, which is 1. Well, I get 18 when I plug in that. I can do that math in my head, but it's back to being positive again. So what does this mean? I'm increasing, I'm increasing some more, then I'm decreasing. What kind of point does that make 1? That makes 1 a maximum. I'm decreasing, I hit 2, and then I'm increasing. What kind of point does that make 2? minimum. So one's a maximum and two's a minimum. Let's look at one on this thing. Two, zero is nothing. So I can automatically cancel out A and B. They're talking about zero being maxes or mins. No, zero is going to be nothing. So what about one? One is actually a maximum. What do they tell me it's supposed to be in this problem? Minimum. So E is wrong. So the now the answer is either C or D. So what do we have at two? Was two a maximum or minimum? It was a minimum. They declared it to be minimum in Part D. What a surprise. Yeah, you're right. It's got to be Part D for the answer. Does that make sense? Did I lose you guys anywhere? And then notice, I did it without a calculator. But at some point on this thing, I'm going to use my calculator. And if I get to it before I've given time, been told that I'm allowed to use calculator, I'll just come back to it. Let's take a look at this problem. The complete graph of y equals f prime of x is shown. Which of the following is uh, intervals below is f concave up? Note that you are given the derivative f prime, but you're being asked about the original function f. So this is my graph of f prime. 
What are they asking me? They're asking me, here's my question. On which intervals is F concave up? Where is F concave up? F is concave up implies what? When you're talking about concavity, what are you dealing with? That's what I'm talking about the second derivative. And what about that second derivative? Concave up has got to be, second derivative has got to be positive. But you're given the graph of f prime. So I want where f double prime is greater than zero. This implies that f prime prime, that's what the double second derivative is, has got to be greater than zero. Does that make sense? Because I'm now talking theory at you guys. For the second derivative to be greater than zero, I've got to look at it from, I've only got the graph of the first derivative. So if the second derivative is greater than zero, that means the derivative of the first derivative has got to be greater than zero. Listen to my words. The derivative of the first derivative has got to be greater than zero. What does that mean? Well, the derivative is when we're talking about increasing or decreasing. That means f prime has to be, uh, has to be increasing, right? f prime increasing on graph. Where is my f prime increasing? To increase on f prime graph, that means f prime has to be above the x axis. Because that means f prime is going to have to be increasing. That's going to be greater than zero. So it's got to be above the x axis. Where is my derivative graph above the x axis? Between negative 2 and negative 1 in here. And between, what's that, about 1.5 to 2 in here. So it looks like the answer is between negative 2 and negative 1, union 1.5 to 2. That's where my derivative is greater than 0 here. Oh, excuse me, I screwed up. I, uh, uh, nope, 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 I screwed up. This is my fault. I looked down and looked at the question. Okay, first off, forget what I just said there. Don't forget this answer. This is right. Where's F prime increasing? To increase, what do we got to look at? where it's going to be going up at. I looked down and looked back up and I forgot what the question was. All right, this is my fault. Where is F prime going to be increasing at? Increasing means the slope has to be what? Where is the slope positive here? Going up. What interval is the slope positive? From 1 to 2. So my answer is D, of course, uh, from 1 to 2. All right, so let me redo this problem because in the middle of the problem, I looked down and looked back up and I thought about supper. So I forgot. So let me try this again. All right, understand this question. It says this. F is concave up. That means I'm looking for where the second derivative is it greater than zero. But where the second derivative is it greater than zero implies it's where the first derivative derivative is greater than zero. So when we're trying to take a derivative, we're talking about increasing. To increase, we're talking about going up. This is the uh, set first derivative graph. Where is that graph going up? Going up on the graph. And it's going up on the interval between 1 and 2. So the interval between 1 and 2 is where the function is increasing. So the answer is between 1 and 2. Does that make sense? Because that's where the first derivative is increasing. The increase or decrease means your derivative. We're looking at the derivative, and we're looking where the derivative is increasing. That's actually the second derivative, and that's where the second derivative is going to be positive at between 1 and 2. Does that make sense? All right, let's take a look at number three, uh, number six here. All right, number six. They love to ask this question because I even put one of these guys on my old test and stuff about this idea of being continuous. A function is continuous if three things hold. The limit exists. The functional value exists, and they've got to be equal to each other. Does that make sense? Three things for the, for the function to be continuous. The limit has to exist, the functional value has to, to exist, and they've got to be equal to each other. That is your definition of being continuous. We've got ourselves a piecewise function. So where is this guy going to be continuous at? The problem with piecewise is going to be this. I got this nice function as long as I'm not 1, and then I got this constant k when I do have 1. To be continuous, basically my functional value exists. It's got 1, it's going to be k. The limit's going to exist. It's going to be whatever I plug in, getting really, really close to 1 here. 
but to be to be continuous, these two guys have to be equal to each other. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take my limit as x approaches 1 of this x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. And that's going to have to be equal to this as the limit has to equal the functional value. And the functional value at 1 happens to be k. Does that make sense? So for, the, for this thing to be continuous, the limit of the piecewise function when you're not 1 has to be equal to the constant k when you are 1. They're connecting the dots. Now, how do I take the limit as x approaches 1 of this guy? You've got two options. You can do algebra on it, because if you plug in 1, 1 squared minus 1 is 0, over 1 minus 1 is 0. I've got 0 over 0. You can, quote, unquote, do algebra if you want to, or you can use L'Hopital's rule. We're trying to drum in you guys this concept of L'Hopital's rule, so I'll keep focusing on that. So I'm going to apply L'Hopital's rule to this guy. This will be the limit as x approaches 1 of, here at the top is 2x, here at the bottom is 1. When I plug in 1, I get 2. If I did algebra, this would be x plus 1 times x minus 1. The x minus 1's cancel. So when I take the limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. I get the same answer. Your choice on which way you want to do it. But that means that k has to be equal to 2, so the answer is e. k is equal to 2. Take a look at number 7. The three functions are listed below. Which of the functions have an inverse function on the domain negative infinity to infinity? There are two ways I can do this particular problem. Okay? The first way is probably the way I need you to review, you guys, but I'll show you a different way I could have done this one. The first way is actually get my inverse functions. So number one, if f of x is equal to x squared, right, and we're going to find the inverse of this guy, that's going to be y equals x squared implies that x equals y squared, which means y is equal to the square root of x. There's going to be my inverse function of that guy. Okay? What is the domain of this function? What kind of numbers can you plug into the square root of x? From bracket 0 to infinity. Number 2, I have got g of x is equal to 3x plus 1. This implies y equals 3x plus 1. This implies x is equal to 3y plus 1. This implies y equals x minus 1 divided by 3. Yeah, I can do some math in my head. Does that make sense? Subtract 1 divided by 3 is all I did. What is the domain of this guy? What kind of numbers can you plug in for x? Can you plug in 0? Can you plug in negative numbers, subtract 1 divided by 3? Can you plug in positive numbers, subtract 1 divided by 3? So what's your domain? All real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. All right, number three. I got h of x is equal to the sine of x. All right? This implies that y equals the sine of x. This implies that x is equal to the sine of y, which implies that y is equal to the sine inverse of x. Get rid of sine. I take the sine inverse of both sides. Let's see what you guys remember about this dude. What is the domain of the sine inverse of x? In other words, what kind of numbers can I plug into a sine inverse or an arc sine? No, that's where you're defining on the unit circle, but what kind of numbers are you going to get back on the sine function? Sine functions bounce between what two numbers? Negative 1 and 1. So when you're doing sine inverse, you've got to plug in numbers like square root of 2 over 2 to get pi force back again. So you've got to plug in numbers between negative 1 and positive 1. That's the domain of the sine inverse function. So which one of these guys, if not all of them, have a domain for the inverse to be in negative infinity to infinity? <coughs> Two only. The answer is G only uh, B. The other way I could have done this, and I think it would have been a lot quicker, would have been this. Domain and range. 
Here's a quick way and a probably a better way of doing this problem, but to explain it, people want me to do this. Domain and range. If you've got a function, x is the domain, y is the range. When you do the inverse, your domain becomes the range and the range becomes the domain on the inverse function. Does that remember that from doing inverses? You switch domains and ranges. So what I'm going to do here to figure out the domain of the inverse is look at the range of each one of these guys. The range. If I take any numbers and square them, what numbers am I bouncing between? Zero to infinity. Because you square any number, you're going to get positive numbers, right? It's zero to infinity. It's the range. So the range of this function becomes the domain of the inverse. What is the, the range of uh, what g of x equals 3x plus 1? Well, it's a line going from negative infinity to positive infinity. It goes down and goes up. So the domain is all real numbers. The range is all real numbers. So when you switch that, the domain for the inverse will be all real numbers. Sign. Sign, the domain is the negative infinity to infinity. We, we focus on 0 to 2 pi, but the domain is actually any angle you can think of. Negative infinity to infinity. But when you look at a sine graph, a sine graph waves back and forth, bounces back and forth between what two numbers? Negative 1 and 1. So the domain is between negative 1 and 1, and the range is between, you see, excuse me, the domain is in all real numbers, but the domain, uh, the, the range is between negative 1 and 1. For the inverse, the range becomes a the domain. There it is, negative 1 to 1. So therefore, the only one that actually has, the original function had the range of negative infinity to infinity, hence the inverse will have the domain of negative infinity to infinity, is B only. That's another way you could have done this problem without doing so much finding the inverse, dude. Take a look at the next guy, number eight. Finally, a related rate. And this is the multiple choice parts. You know there's going to be one on the free response. Guarantee there's going to be an optimization problem on the free response and a related rate problem on the free response. Suppose that x and y are functions of t. x squared plus y squared equals 25. dy dt is always 6. Find dx dt when y equals 4 and x has got to be greater than 0. So here we go. I've got the function x squared plus y squared equals 25. We have here that dy over dt is equal to 6. We are supposed to find dx over dt when y equals 4. There's my question. So to find this dx dt, I'm going to come over here and take my equation, x squared plus y squared equals 25, and take the derivative of it with respect to t. This is part of that implicit differentiation related rate stuff. So when I take a derivative of a variable with respect to t, every time I take a derivative of a variable, I tack on d variable dt throughout the entire problem. So what is the derivative of x squared with respect to t then? 2x dx dt. Every time you take a derivative of a variable, you tack on a d variable dt. Plus, what's the derivative of y squared? 2y what? dy over dt, related rate, equals, but here's a catcher, don't screw this one up, what's the root of 25 with respect to pretty much anybody, including t? Zero, because it's a constant, right? So now, here's my dude, dx dt, that's what I'm supposed to find. All these other guys better be variables I can plug into. So here we go. This will be 2 times x times dx dt, which is what I'm trying to solve for plus 2 times y times dy dt is supposed to be equal to 0. Plug in what you know. What's dy dt equal to? 6. We're supposed to find dx dt when y equals 4, so replace y with 4. And there it is, and there's my classic problem. I got almost all my variables plugged into so I can solve this thing. There's one problem. I don't know what x is. I got to find x so I can solve this thing. So what am I going to do? Go back to the original equation. My original equation was x squared plus y squared equals 4. I know what y equals. What was y equal to? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, that was equal to 25. Lost my train of thought there. Uh, x squared plus y squared equals 25. There's my equation. But what's y equal to? 4. I'm going to plug it in. So it gives me x squared plus 4 squared equals 25. x squared plus 16 equals 25. This makes x squared equal to 9. Right? And what kills off a square? 
Square root of both sides. And what is the square root of 9? Officially, it's plus or minus 3. But which one am I going to use? Positive 3. Why positive 3? Because they told me x was greater than 0. So I'm going to use positive 3. So I now know that x is 3, so I can plug that in right in here. 3. And then I get the equation. 6 dx over dt plus 2 times 4, which is 8. And 8 times 6 is 48 equals 0. Solving for it, this implies that dx over dt is going to be negative 48 divided by 6. And what's negative 48 divided by 6? Negative 8. The answer is A. Does that make sense? Questions? And remember this back substitution to figure out your other constant. They always like to do that to you. <coughs> other formulas you have to have memorized. And again, I keep reminding you of this. Don't let this be the only exam you've got to go over. You've got to know Newton's Law of Cooling. Uh, you've got to know the exponential growth formulas, exponential decay. Don't forget your compound interest formulas. Regular compound as well as compounded continuously. You've got bunches and bunches of formulas to go back through and make sure you've got them memorized for this exam. A colony of bacteria grows at a rate proportional to its size. Those words right there, grows at a rate proportional to its size, implies that I'm going to use the formula P of T equals P naught E to the KT. That just tells me what formula I'm going to use from the Chapter 3 stuff. Initially, there were 100 cells in the colony. Initially means that's P of 0. P at time equals 0 equals 100. The colony triples in size every two hours. Okay? So we have it triples every two hours. Approximately... How many cells are in there after seven hours? Clearly, this is going to be a calculator question here. But here we go. P of t equals p naught e to the kt. I know what p naught is. p naught is my initial size, which was 100. So p of t equals 100 e to the kt. This right here, it triples every two hours, is conditional information allowing me to figure out my exponential growth constant, k. So, when I plug in 2 hours, so this would be 100 equals 100 times e to the k times 2, it triples my size. I started out with 100. If I triple it, how much, how much do I have now? How many bacteria do I have now? 300. It triples every 2 hours. So the first 2 hours would take 100 and blow it up to 300. Does that make sense? It triples every 3 hours. You know you have enough information. Solve for K. I'm going to divide by 100 on both sides here. This is going to give me 3 equals E to the 2K. I'm going to take the natural log of both sides because natural logs kill off E's, and I get 2K. I divide by 2, and that tells me K equals the natural log of 3 divided by 2, which is nothing but a number on my calculator. Natural log of 3 divided by 2, which is 0.54931. Four or five decimal places on the multiple choice will give you enough digits for you guys to be able to match what the answer is going to be. So now we have our formula. My formula is right here. It is P of T equals 100 E to the K, which is 0.54931 T. Well, once you got the equation, you can go back and answer any question they ask. If they ask for, in this case, what's the population after seven hours, what am I going to do? Plug in seven for T. But if they ask me this question, what is the rate of change after seven hours? What are you going to do then? Rate of change. When you hear those magic words, find the rate of change. What are you going to do? Take the derivative and then plug in seven. Does that make sense? But they didn't ask for rate of change here. They just said, how many cells are present after 7 hours? So this would be P of 7, which would be 100E to the 0.54931 times 7. And it's off to the races on the calculator.
100 times e raised to the 0.54931 oops, 31, times 7, all in the exponent there, and I got 4,676.6634. Is that enough information for me to be able to find my dude? Yeah, which one is it? <laughs> Clearly, it's got to be D. It's always D, okay, at least on this test. All right, does that make sense? Did I lose you guys anywhere? Here's another formula you better have memorized, the linear approximation formula. What is my linear approximation formula? To find a linear approximation, the formula is L of X is equal to F of A plus F prime of A times X minus A. And A is your centering point. But remember this. If you ever get lost on the concept to find the linearization, find the equation of the tangent line and it's the same thing. It's just a fancy way of saying find the equation of the tangent line. So the word linearization and the equation of the tangent line is the exact same thing. But the linearization is a nice formula that you have, so I'll use the formula because that's the way they want you to do it. So here we go. They gave me a function. f of x is equal to 4 <coughs> over 1 plus x squared. I need to find what f of my centering point is, which is 1. I'm going to plug in 1 in this thing. This will give me 4 over 1 plus 1 squared. No problem there. This is 4 over 1. 1 squared is 1 plus 1 is 2. 4 divided by 2 is 2. So my functional value is 2. f of 1 equals 2. Now the next thing you've got to have is f prime of x. Now, there's two ways I can take derivative of this guy. What rule would you use to take derivative of 4 over 1 plus x squared? Officially, I can use the quotient rule. But because the top is a constant, you know what I could do? I could clean up my function over here and call him 4 times 1 plus x squared to the negative 1. And instead of using the quotient rule, I could use the chain rule. I can still get the same answer, whichever way is easiest for you. But remember, with the quotient rule, when you take derivative of the top, you end up being zero, which kills off half your term. But when I do the, the chain rule, ah, well, good practice. Chain rule, derivative of the outside, negative 4, inside, 1 plus x squared, stay same, subtract 1 for the exponent, raise to negative 2, times derivative of the inside, which is 2x. So when I clean this thing up, again, this is my, and I should put error there, this is my derivative here, okay? And so when I clean up my derivative, I end up getting what? Let's see here. 2x times negative 4 is negative 8x over 1 plus x squared squared. And that's what you would have gotten if you did the quotient rule on this thing. But don't care. fact of the matter is, what do I have to do to this thing? i got to plug in my centering point, which is what? 1, that will be negative 8 times 1 over 1 plus 1 squared squared. This will be negative 8 over 1 squared is 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 squared is 4. And 8 divided by 4 is negative 2. So therefore, my linearization equation, L of X, is going to be equal to F of A. This will be F of 1, which is equal to 2. Plus the derivative, I got negative 2 for my derivative times x minus my a, which was 1. Of course, that's not how they wrote the answer, so I'm going to have to clean them up a little bit. No worries there. This will be 2 minus 2x two plus 2. And what's 2 plus 2 also known as? 4. So my linearization equation is going to be 4 minus 2x. And all I did was clean them up. 4 minus 2x, which is letter... E this time. Does that make sense? Did I lose you guys anywhere? Questions? All right. Let's take a look at the next guy. I'll blow it up so you guys can see in the back. Let X 
times y cubed plus 3x minus 2y equals 6. Find dy over dx at the point 2, negative 1. Okay? Well, I'm going to show you guys the shortcut method of doing this problem. And that is, go ahead and take your derivative using implicit differentiation. But then, since you're trying to find dy dx at a particular point, don't solve for the dy dx. Go ahead and plug in the point, and then it makes it easier to solve for dy dx when you've got numbers. So, I'm going to have xy cubed plus 3x minus 2y equals 6, and I'm going to take my derivative with respect to x. So when I take a derivative of an x, that's great. But every time I take a derivative of y, I have to tack on this dy dx. So to take a derivative with respect to x, look at this first term right here. x times y cubed. What is that? A product. So what, what rule do I have to use? Product rule. Derivative of the first. Derivative of x is 1 times the second y cubed plus the first x times derivative of the second. Derivative of y cubed is 3y squared dy over dx. Does that make sense? Derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the second. I'll go back and clean them up later. Plus, what is the derivative of 3x with respect to x? 3 minus what's the derivative of 2y with respect to x? 2 is a constant. Hold over. What's the derivative of y with respect to x? dy over dx. Equals what's the derivative of 6 with respect to x? Being a constant is a 0. Does that make sense? Don't lose you guys anywhere. Okay, now, I'm going to clean this up. This will be y cubed plus 3xy squared dy over dx plus 3 minus 2 dy over dx equals 0. Now, honestly, I could sit there and manipulate this equation by subtracting y cubed and subtracting 3, factoring out the dy dx and dividing it through to get dy dx by himself, and then plug in my numbers, <coughs> but there's chances of careless errors on that. So what I recommend my students doing is this. Once you take your derivative and they want to find a particular point, go ahead now, and after you take your derivative, plug in x is 1, I'm sorry, well, x is 2, and y equals 1 into your equation. This will be 1 cubed plus 3 times x, x is 2, times 1 squared times dy over dx, plus 3 minus 2 dy over dx equals 0. Now you're manipulating numbers, which is easier and less chance of careless errors. 1 cubed is 1, plus 3 is 4. 3 times 2 is 6 times 1 squared is still 1. That'll be 6 dy dx. Minus 2 dy dx is going to be 4 dy dx is equal to 0. What does dy dx have to be? That's pretty obvious, but we'll sub subtract 4 from both sides, show you the algebra here. So this gives me 4 dy over dx equals negative 4. I'm going to divide by 4 on both sides, and that's a negative 4, so this cancels. So dy over dx is equal to what? Negative 1. Why don't you go ahead? Does that make sense? Question? All right. Again, the purpose of studying old final exams is to go back over and to, one, refresh your skills on some stuff you haven't done in a while, and two, remind yourself the formulas. Here's one you just had. You should have this one relatively memorized. You wish to solve the equation x cubed plus 3x equals 5 using Newton's method with x1 equals 1 as your initial approximation. Find x2, the second approximation. Okay? So I've got the equation, x cubed plus 3x equals 5. Newton's method finds zeros of equations, right? Zeros, roots, x-intercepts. What is a zero root x-intercept? That is where the function is equal to what number? <coughs> zero. So to get what function I have to use, I've got to subtract 5 from both sides. So this gives me x cubed plus 3x minus 5 equals zero. Very important first step. You've got to set the function equal to zero. So now my function is going to be x cubed plus 3x minus 5. My derivative is going to be 3x squared plus 3. Does that make sense? 
Now, what is Newton's method? Newton's method for me, xn plus 1 equals xn minus f of xn divided by f prime of xn. Again, another form you have to have memorized. Remember, it's xn minus the functional over the derivative, f over f prime. They told me what my first approximation is. x1 is supposed to be 1. So my x2 is going to be 1 minus f of 1 over f prime of 1. Does that make sense? Now coming over here, f of 1 is going to be 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 minus 5. I can do that kind of math without a calculator. Let's see here. 1 cubed is like 1. 3 times 1 is 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. And 4 minus 5 is negative 1. f prime of 1 is going to be 3 times 1 squared plus 3. 1 squared is 1, plus 3, uh, so times 3 is 3, plus 3 is 6. So this is equal to 1 minus, watch your signs, negative 1 over 6. So the answer is, when you clean it up, x2 is going to be 1 and 1 sixth. And what's 1 and 1 sixth also known as? Well, they want a decimal, so go calculator here. 1 plus 1 sixth is 1.166667, which is approximately, they went two decimal places on it, 1.17, which is answer B. Does that make sense? Now it is time for the part three of your exam. You'll hold on in part two and part three and turn these things in at the same time for most professors, my class especially. So here is my part three. All right, so I finished part two. I bubbled in everything and I got it set up. I use that as a cover sheet because most of your classrooms are going to be packed in like sardines. So we're going to be having extra people to look high and low for students, keeping making sure you keep your eyes on your own paper, as well as using basically uh, exams upside down to cover up your work. Always cover up your work. So here it goes, the free response part of the thing. And remember, listen up and listen good. When it comes to the free response, Remember, it is competition. You know something about every problem on this thing. Take a derivative of something at least. Welcome to Calculus 1. But the fact of the matter is you know something about every problem on this thing. Don't leave anything blank. Write it down. Write down. Put in the blanks of something that you know about the particular problem. Try to come up with some kind of an equation. It comes kind of a formula. We do grade this stuff off of partial credit. So we're looking at the work for this stuff. If you don't get it completely right, but you see you started out on the right track, you can pick up one or two points out of five points or something like that. Okay? Sure beats getting a zero on it. Don't leave anything blank. You let those other professors and those other classes, you let their students fill in blank. Because trust me, I love when I grade blank tests. They're real easy to grade. Just put a big old zero on it and move to the next problem. Okay? That I can do any day of the week. But I want you guys, especially my students, but everybody in here, you know something about a problem. Write something down. <coughs> write it down. They're going to try to help you out with this problem by giving you steps. But remember, there's going to be some hard problems on this thing. They're going to try to separate the A students from the B students. You be one of those A students. Try to figure out what they're talking about and come up with a mathematical way through Calculus 1 to be able to get your solution. Let's take a look at this first problem here. A particle is moving along the curve at y equals the square root of x. As the car particle passes through the point 4, 2, okay, and here's the point 4, 2, right about there, its x coordinate is increasing at a rate of 5 centimeters per second. How fast is the distance between the particle to the origin changing at that particular instant? People look at this thing and go, I don't have a clue on what to do on this one. Well, first thing is this. Read the stupid problem and look at some of the problems and parts in that. Especially pay attention to units. There's a physics component to this stuff. Right there. 
5 centimeters per second. What is that? Well, granted, 5 centimeters per second, but its x coordinate is increasing at a rate of 5 centimeters per second. This is a related rate problem. And they're telling me x coordinate is increasing. They're automatically telling me dx over dt is equal to 5, officially, centimeters per second. Okay? The question is, how fast is the distance? They're calling d to this distance from the origin. Zero, zero here. <coughs> distance from the origin. What do you see on this particular problem right here? I see a triangle, and I'm interested in this concept of z down here. And I'm dealing with all the distance. This is your x-coordinate. It goes over on the x-axis. This is your y-coordinate. goes up the y-axis here. So what major theorem do you know that connects all the sides on a triangle? Pythagorean theorem. What's the Pythagorean theorem? x squared plus y squared equals, in this case, z squared. There's my relationship between all that stuff. And they told me something else. y was equal to the square root of x on this particular part. So I've got this particular function here. And I got this interesting point for 2, which I'll talk about later. Okay? So, and here's the other part. I'm writing down every. I haven't even looked at the stupid questions yet. I'm writing down everything that I know on this problem. This is what we want you guys to do. How fast is the distance from the particle to the origin? Particle is right here. To the origin changing at that instant. At this instant. What am I looking for? How fast the distance from the origin to the particle is changing. What am I looking for? Rate of change of what? Of the x, which is your distance from the origin, which is what am I looking for? I'm looking for dx dt. There's going to be my question right there. At the instant that the particle passes through the point 4, 2. This is x, and this is y. Does that make sense? So it's a classic related rate problem, but they're going to try to help you out by answering the questions here. Suppose the particle is located at point x, y somewhere on the curve, on where y equals the square root of x. Z represents the distance from the particle to the origin. Z diagram above. Write an equation that relates x and y to z. What was the equation that connected x, y, and z together? The Pythagorean theorem. There's two points right there. x squared plus y squared equals z squared. That's what you had to tell us in the blank. Does that make sense? They're going to try to help you get step through this thing. All right? But if you can't figure out their steps, just go and solve the question and then circle your answer to the bottom and just put some arrows to some stuff. They'll give you credit for it. All right? Let's get the right answer. All right? B. When is the point XY on the curve? When, okay, when the point XY is on the curve, how is Y related to X? Use this facts in equation A to express an, a, a z only in terms of x. Eliminate y. What was y equal to? Square root of x. So I have this. y equals the square root of x, and I have the fact that x squared plus y squared equals z squared, right? They told me to eliminate basically y. Well, I'm going to do a substitute. So x squared plus y, which is the square root of x, squared equals z squared. Cleaning it up, this is going to be x squared plus, what's the square root of x squared? x equals z squared. Believe it or not, that's what we were looking for in part number b. They wanted you to take this equation, but they gave me a relationship between x and y. Plug that in so I can eliminate some variables. Eliminate the y, so I don't need y. x squared plus z equals, to x squared plus x equals z squared. Now differentiate both sides so with respect to time. So I've got x squared plus x equals z squared, and I'm supposed to take derivative with respect to t, with respect to time. So remember, this is a related rate implicit differentiation kind of a problem here. So what is the derivative of x squared with respect to t, please? What is it? 2x what? Very good. dx dt plus what's the derivative of x? 1 what? 1 dx over dt equals what's the derivative of z squared with respect to t? 2z what? 
dz over dt. Remember, that's the dude we're looking for. But, honestly, this is what they want an answer. That's all they asked me to do, was take the derivative of the equation with respect to time. But now we're going to go and get our answers. What is dx over dt when the particle is equal to 4, 2? We were going to give you points on this one because people jot on this problem so much. What was dx over dt equal to? Thank you. Yeah, we're going over 5. Okay. The x coordinate is increasing at a rate of 5 centimeters per second. And they even tell you, reread the problem to come up with this number here. What is it? 5. Well, there's a point right there that we're going to give you if you actually gave them that one. You know, one more point on the exam is better than no points on that exam. All right, and then what else? And use this fact to evaluate dx dt. And we got the point. Remember, x is equal to 4 when y is equal to 2 at the point 4, 2. And I got 2x dx over dt plus dx over dt equals 2z dz over dt. You'll notice one little problem, and it's a classic problem. Plug in the numbers that you got. This will be 2 times, what's x equal to? 4. What's dx over dt equal to? 5. Plus dx over dt is what? 5 equals 2z. And remember, dz over dt, that's your variable. You want to leave that blank because that's what you want to solve for. There's one dude I don't know who he is. What's his name? Z. How am I going to figure out what z is going to be equal to? Back to the Pythagorean theorem. Remember this. x squared plus y squared equals z squared. That was my original equation. Let me back down and come see this. x squared plus y squared equals z squared. What was x equal to? 4. 4 squared. What was y equal to? 2 squared equals z squared. What's 4 squared is uh, 16. Plus 2 squared is 4 equals z squared. 20 equals z squared. So what does that make z equal to? square root of 20. And this thing is a distance, and it's a positive distance. So fish check into plus or minus the square root. Because the picture and this distance as the particle moves away, it is a positive z. Does that make sense? So I'm going to plug in here the square root of 20. And now I'm going to solve this problem. Here we go. This is uh, 4 times 5 is 20. 20 times 2 is how much? 40 plus 5 is equal to 2 square roots of 20 dz over dt. This will be 45 is equal to 2 square roots of 20 dz <coughs> over dt. This means that dz over dt is equal to 45 over 2 square roots of 20. Also, for you fans, square root of 20 is the same thing as uh, 4 times 5. Square root of 4 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. I would also accept 45 over 4 square roots of 5. If you wanted to rationalize it, knock yourself out. But I accepted that one too. Okay, uh, let's see here. And let's keep going here. And 4 times the square root of 5, so 45 divided by parentheses 4 square roots of 5. Oops. Get rid of that guy and uh, delete that. And over arrow, close parentheses there. All right. And what else do I get? For you fans, I get 5.03115. But wait a minute. Don't forget your units. And what's my units here? Centimeters per second. Don't forget that. That was worth a point on this thing as well. Forgetting units is deadly. Did I lose you guys anywhere? Was this that bad of a problem? Now, for a lot of people, doing this step one, step two, step three frustrates them. And if it does, that's okay. You go back up here, and you'd sit there and take y and plug in y as the square root of x, get your equation, take derivative, find dx, d, d, dz, dt, solve for it, get your answer, and then start going back and trying to figure out, put the, put the parts into the answers. 
you'll, you'll get it that way too. If, if the words bother you, just get the answer that they asked for originally and then go back and try to figure out what goes where. That's another way you can do this if you don't like their directions. Does that make sense? Question? Yeah. All right. Here we go. I stole this problem and actually put it on uh, my test number four for a lot of students, version A for a lot of students here. Okay, function F satisfies the condition below. Use the information uh, to answer the question below. All right? A function, okay, so the domain of the function is all real numbers except x equals zero. I have f of negative one equals negative one. I have f of one equals zero. And I have f of uh, three halves equals negative one half. x equals zero is a vertical isomptote. f prime is greater than zero on the intervals between negative one and zero and zero to one. f prime is less than zero on the intervals between negative infinity to negative one and one to infinity. And f double prime is less than zero on the intervals between zero and three halves. And f double prime is on the interval between uh, intervals, bad spelling there, of negative infinity to zero and three halves to infinity. The first thing you should do is actually, before I go and answer questions, even though part C it says sketch the graph, I would have done that right from the beginning. That helps you understand the problem here. All right. First things first, they gave you some points. When x was negative 1, so I'm going to make over here a mark, negative 1. When x is negative 1, y is negative 1. So I got a point right there on my graph. Okay? f of 1 is equal to 0. When x is equal to 1, y is equal to 0. So I got to go through that point. And they gave me one other point on this thing. And that other point on this thing was f of 3 halves. 3 halves happens to be 1.5, right about there. Uh, 1.5, I'm getting negative a half. So here is 3 halves. Here is negative 1 half. I'm going to go through this point right here. So, x equals 0 is a vertical isomptote. How do I put that on my graph? x equals 0 is a vertical isomptote. x equals 0 is called the y-axis. Here is a line drawn in the sand that you can't cross. So which means as I get to a vertical isomptote, I've got to either blow up or blow down, depending on which side I'm on and how the function is going. So I can't, I'm either going to blow up to positive infinity or blow down to negative infinity on either side. What about this right here? As x approaches infinity, f of x is equal to negative 1. That is a definition. What is that definition? What do you call it when you take the limit as x approaches either plus or minus infinity? It's called the horizontal isomptote. So this is telling me the horizontal isomptote when x approaches positive infinity, I get the equation y equals negative 1. So down here on the bottom, y equals negative 1. is a horizontal isomptote, and I'm approaching this thing as I go towards positive infinity. They didn't say anything about negative infinity. They just said positive infinity. So as I approach positive infinity, I'm going to level off to y equals negative 1. Remember, you can cross horizontal isomptotes. You can never cross a vertical isomptote. Okay? Horizontal isomptotes only tell me uh, basically what's happening in infinity and or negative infinity. So here we go. Now let's go put all this stuff together on this particular problem here. F prime is greater than zero on the intervals between negative one and zero and zero to one. Negative one to zero, F prime is greater than zero. What does greater than zero mean? It's increasing. F prime, that means derivative, it's increasing. So I know I'm going to be going up. I'm going to draw that very lightly in there, but I'm going to, you can see my line I drew in there. I'm going to be going up. Okay, between negative 1 and 0, and between 0 and 1. And between 0 and 1, 0 and 1, I've got to be going up. And I've got to hit this point right here, so I've got to be going up this way too. Very lightly drawn in there. And just some vertical lines, lightly, because I don't want to really see this. I know I'm going up. 
Now, let's put the rest of it in there by increasing, decreasing. F prime is less than zero, so I'm decreasing on the intervals between negative infinity to negative one. So negative infinity up to negative one, I know I'm going down, somewhere down here. And between one and infinity. One and infinity, I'm going down. But remember, I'm, I've got to go through this point, but I've also got to connect myself to this horizontal isotope. So I've got these lines where I know I'm going up, I'm going down. Now I'm going to put my concavity in there through the second derivative. So now I'm going to start graphing this thing. F prime is less than zero on the interval between zero and three halves. F prime less than zero means I'm concave down. Remember, F prime greater than zero, I'm in increasing. <coughs> F prime less than zero, I'm decreasing. F, prime le F double prime less than zero, I'm concave down. F double prime greater than zero, I'm concave up. So I'm going to be concave down on the interval between zero and three halves. Zero and three halves, I've got to go through these two points, and I've got to be concave down. So now I'm starting to fill this thing out. And I've got a vertical isotope here, so I know I've got to shoot down, straight down as this thing goes down. Because I can't cross it. Okay? And I'm going to be concave up on the interval between negative infinity to zero. I've got to go through this point. And between negative infinity to zero, I've got to be concave up. I've got to increase on this side. I'm going to be decreasing, so I'm going to be doing this. So there's my graph on this side. Remember, vertical isotopes, I can't cross. And then the last part is I've got to be concave up between three halves and infinity. So I'm going to be concave up, but I've got to be decreasing to connect my points here. So that's concave up there. That makes three halves an inflection point. There it is. So here is my graph. Does that make sense? And that's the graph we were looking for. Now, once you get the graph, question? Uh, how, can, uh, how can three halves infinity be concave up if it's decreasing? Oh, sure. You can decrease means I'm going down, but be concave up means I'm going down, but I'm bent upward. So it looks like that. You read a graph from left to right. So you're going down, but I'm U'd upward. Concavity is U upward. Does that make sense? So this is decreasing, but I'm concave up. This is decreasing, I'm concave down. This is increasing, I'm concave down. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, now, let's go back and answer the questions. List the intervals which the uh, graph is concave up. Concave up dealt with what? Second derivative. It's right here. Concave up. What's my intervals? Between negative infinity to zero, union, three halves to infinity. You can get it from the information here. Or you can actually get it from the picture. Where am I concave up at? Negative infinity to zero, and I'm concave up from three halves to infinity. The second one is list any horizontal isotopes. Do we have any horizontal isotopes? Do we have any limits as x either goes negative infinity or positive infinity? Yeah, we did. There it is right there. But remember, horizontal isotopes are y equals, vertical isotopes are x equals. So what would be my answer here? Y equals, what was the horizontal isotope? Negative 1. <coughs> so I lose you guys anywhere on that. Very important. I'd love to give this graph stuff to you guys. All right. I have a graph here. This is a graph of y equals f of x. The curve shown is the graph of y equals f of x. List any intervals where the function is increasing. Well, I can read that right off the graph. This is y equals f of x graph, so increasing means it goes up. Decreasing means it goes down. Where is it going up at? Where is it, uh, well, first off, Let's graph y equals. Where is it? Where is it decreasing at? Where is this thing going to be decreasing at? Well, it looks like this point down to four. What numbers are those? Two to four. Is it decreasing anywhere else? Yep. Union. I'm going back up again. Now I'm going down from where? Six to infinity. This will be my answer. It's your ability to interpret. P graphs. I'm going up. 
And so I'm going down on those intervals, decreasing, going down from here to here and from six here. So between two and four and six to infinity. List any values where the function is equal to zero. These are x numbers. What x numbers is my function equal to zero? Well, the derivative is equal to zero. These are called max min points. Where are the derivative equal to zero at? Two, four, and six. So x equals two, x equals four, and x equals six. Does that make sense? List any intervals where f is concave up. Concave up means my second derivative is positive, but if they got the original graph, I'm looking where it's u-shaped up at. Where is it you shaped up at? Now, here's important. You've got to find your inflection numbers. I think my inflection numbers are here and here. And I'm going to call that, and we were very <laughs> liberal in terms of numbers because it's actually like 2.75, and some people put that, but most people put 3 and 5 in terms of general numbers here. So where is it concave up at? Between 3 and 5. If you wrote like 2.75 to 5.25, yeah, okay, we'll give you that. But basically, we wanted those numbers 3 to 5. We're trying to make it match the numbers on the graph. Yeah. Between 2 and 6, because 6, what's happening right here at 6? Is that concave up or concave down? It's concave down to right about there, and then it's back to concave up. The 3 and 5 are actually the inflection points where they change concave. And here's the one that killed people. Most folks got A, B, and C, but we, we graded it like this. 1 point, 1 point, 1 point, 12 points or something like that. All right, so uh, give me the graph. What's the graph of what? What are we supposed to graph here? Sketch the graph of F prime of X. All right. The graph of F prime of X. The first thing, if you've got the original function, you want to sketch the graph of the derivative Find the critical points where the derivative is equal to zero. Where are the numbers where the derivative is equal to zero at? Two, four, and six. So at two, the derivative is zero, so you'll be cross when you graph it, you'll be crossing the x-axis. Four and six. These are my critical numbers. So remember, this is the graph of f prime of x. My my derivative graph. That's where the derivative is equal to zero. Now let's talk about the derivative here. What kind of derivative do I have on this function over here? Well, the function is increasing. What does increasing mean? The derivative is positive, which means, because it's increasing, which means my derivative is above the x-axis. Should look something like this. Once you pass 2, between 2 and 4, what's my function doing now? Decreasing. That means my derivative is negative or it'll be below the x-axis. And I've got to connect my dots here. So I'm doing this connecting graph. This is continuous, so my derivative is going to be nice and continuous here. Now what's happening between 4 and 6? Between 4 and 6, I'm going back to what? Increasing, which means my derivative is positive. So now I have to have a positive derivative. I've got to connect these two points. Positive derivative means my derivative is above the x-axis. And then last but not least, after 6, what's my function doing now? It's decreasing, which means my derivative is what? Negative, and negative graphing it will be below the x-axis. So uh, that's what we were looking for right there. Does that make sense? And that's the one that everybody left blank because they couldn't figure out how to draft the thing. And I thought, well, just sad because you find your critical numbers and then increase, decrease. <coughs> Positive, if it's increasing, it's located above the x-axis. Decreasing, located below the x-axis. And you've got to connect your dots. So it makes it pretty obvious. Yeah? Well, I, well I, and I kind of did that. If you look at these inflection points right here, they really were my max and mins as I connected these guys over. Yeah, but, but we were very liberal because this is not a very elaborate graph, so therefore your answer is not going to be over elaborate, but we were looking for a general picture. How low and how high you went, we didn't care. Does that make sense? All right. Take a look at the next guy. All right, this one, and especially problem number five. 
Problem number five killed students. Let you guys know. Well, let's look at number four first. Number four wasn't too bad. I think most people got number four because it's pretty straightforward stuff from chapter four. Let f of x be equal to x cubed times e to the negative 4x. Find the derivative. What rule would you use to take derivative of this thing? Product rule. So the product rule. Take derivative of the first, 3x squared times the second, e to the negative 4x, plus the first, x cubed times derivative of the second. What's the derivative of e to the negative 4x? What rule would I use? Chain rule versions of e. Derivative of e to the x is e to the x, but derivative of e to a function is e to the function times the derivative of the exponent, which is negative 4. So, of course, you want to clean this guy up here. So, but this is my answer, and I would actually clean this up just to make it look good. f prime of x would be equal to 3x squared e to the negative 4x minus 4x cubed e to the negative 4x, just to make it look good. And circling my answers so the grader can go big old check mark and give me a bunch of points. All right? Part B. Factor the expression in part A to find the critical numbers for f. Yep, we gave you like two points or one point for this, <coughs> but we were trying to set you guys up for stuff. If I was going to factor something out, what would you factor out of this guy? I would take an x squared out, I believe, right? Because that would be the smallest power between the two terms. What else could I factor out? E to the negative 4x. And when I do, what am I left with? A 3 from this term minus what? 4x from this term. So there it is. I factored my guy after I cleaned him up. A lot of folks did this and left it blank and then actually did this guy down here and then factored him. That was fine. But you know, go ahead and clean up your answer. Give us a break. All right, so there you go. I factored it. <coughs> now, express part a, you know, factor the expression part A to find the critical numbers of F. Okay? So now I'm, I'm not done yet. I factored it, but now I've got to find the critical numbers. How do I find critical numbers? What am I going to do? <laughs> set it equal to zero, so I'm going to set each factor. <coughs> X squared equal to zero. E to the negative 4X equals zero and 3 minus 4x equals 0, all right? So what are my critical numbers? Solving for x here, I take the square root of both sides. So the square root of 0 is what? 0. This one, what gets rid of an e? Natural log. Take the natural log of both sides, but what's the natural log of 0? Does not exist. Not allowed to take the natural log of 0, so there will be no answer for this part. And then over here, I would add 4x to the other side, so 3 equals 4x. I would divide by 4, and I get x is equal to 3 fourths. So how many critical uh, numbers where the derivative is equal to 0 actually do you have? Two of them, 0 and 3 fourths. But which ones are going to be relative extremum? Here we go. Determine the intervals uh, where f is increasing and f is uh, decreasing, and show your work. Any time. We ask you for the intervals of something or other. What are you going to do? Number line. So this will be increase or decrease. So this is a number line for the first derivative. I just found my critical numbers. They are 0 and 3 quarters, right? My derivative is actually in this factored form is x squared e to the negative 4x times 3 minus 4x. And now I'm going to pick some points within each interval to figure out if it's increasing or decreasing. So pick a number less than 0. What's your suggestion? Negative 1, of course. F prime of negative 1. Pick a number between 0 and 3 quarters. A half. Good choice. So I would do F prime of 1 half. Pick a number bigger than 3 quarters. I choose 1. Okay? Now, we do have calculators for this thing, and I would use my calculator because this E thing is going to be kind of nasty to plug into. So here I go. Using my calculator, this will be negative 1, plugging it in, negative 1 squared times E raised to the negative 4 times 1, uh, negative 1, excuse me, plugging in negative 1 in for X, times parentheses, 3 minus 4 times negative 1. 
and I get 382.187 something rather. Don't care what is the sign of this number. Pick one half. So again, plugging it in, parentheses, 0.5 squared times e raised to the negative 4 times 0.5 times parentheses 3 minus 4 times 0.5 close parentheses I end up getting 0 0.033833 whatever right eight don't care what the number is what's the sign of that number it's positive so I'm still positive I stopped for a second, then I continued to increase. Now I'm going to plug in 1. Plugging in 1 in this equation will be 1 squared times e raised to the negative 4 times 1 times parentheses 3 <coughs> minus 4 times 1. And I get negative 0 0.0183 something or other. Don't care what the number is, what's the sign of it negative but remember just because you got the graph right or the number line right answer the question what was the question what are the intervals of increase and decrease so give me an answer where is it increasing at negative infinity to zero union zero to three-fourths you have to skip over zero because momentarily it stopped increasing or decreasing right at zero you increase, you stop for a second, and then you increase some more. So because you stop, you skip over zero. Where is it decreasing at? Negative, I'm sorry, three-fourths to infinity. Does that make sense? If I lose you anywhere. And don't forget, circle your answers or box it in or something like that so we can find it. If I lose you guys anywhere. And then the last part of this thing to finish up the total points I can grab off this guy is this. Each critical number determine whether F has a relative maximum, uh, same as local maximum, relative minimum, same as local minimum, or neither. So we, how many critical numbers did we have? Two. They wanted the critical numbers X equals zero and X equals three quarters. Now let's come back and look at this number line. I'm increasing. I stop for a second. I'm increasing. What does that make zero? The neither case. So this would be neither. It's not increasing or decreasing there. It's the neither. What about three-fourths? I'm increasing. I hit three-fourths and then I'm decreasing. What does that make three-fourths? That makes it a max. So they would call this one a relative maximum. Relative or local maximum would be accepted. They're just looking back at this one. So you finished up answering their question. So a couple of points more. So two points, two points, two points, and I think you got more points for taking the root of other. Does that make sense? Well, let's take a look at the last problem. I had the fortune to grade this particular problem, so this was awesome, all right? So I can tell you all about this one. All right, let's read it first. Quote, Steffi plans to warm up by walking from A to B, see diagram, at three miles per hour, then walk from B to C at five miles per hour. She wants to choose X, so that the total time traveled from A to C is a minimum. Okay? Recall that distance is equal to rate times time. There's the hand to help you out here. Okay? You were supposed to figure out find X so that her time is a minimum. Does that make sense? So, they drew the picture for you. This is four miles. This is X, this is a total of five miles. I can tell you on this particular path, from A to B, from A to B, she was doing what? Three miles per hour. That's a rate for that particular spot. That's three miles per hour. And when she went from B to C, how fast was she going then? 
five miles per hour. All right, so here we go. Now, we're looking for time. Time. But first thing I want you to focus on is distances. So focus on this, because here's the deal. She's walking this path. So my little hash mark. She's walking from here to here, then she's walking along this path. So this first path, I need an equation of this thing. And I'm going to do it in terms of x, because the question is about x. So I need x in the problem here. What would you call this distance right here? And what do you see relative to that particular distance that you're looking at from a geometry perspective? I see it's the hypotenuse of a right triangle, right? So I'm going to call this d1, the first leg of her distance. Got to give it a name. I'm going to call it a variable. I'm going to call this thing d1, d for distance. What would d1 be equal to? d1 would be equal to, well, let's see here. How would I come up with an equation? Well, Pythagorean theorem. It will be x squared plus 4 squared is equal to d1 squared. Does that make sense? Or in other words, d1 would be equal to the square root of x squared plus 16, if you think about it. Does that make sense? You see this leg down here? This leg, I'm going to call D2. In terms of X, what is the distance from B to C, this distance here? How much? Well, she went X distance over. The whole thing is what? <coughs> Five miles. If this part is X, how much is this part? Outstanding. D2 is 5 minus X. The rest of it that she has to cover of the five miles. 5 minus X. Does that make sense? Did I lose you guys anywhere? All right. So now, here we go. This was the rate of the first distance. And this 5 miles per hour is the rate of that second leg of distance. First question, part A. Express time as it takes from walking from a to B at 3 miles per hour in terms of X. Here's the hint. Rate times time equals what? Distance. But they want time. What's time equal to then? Time is equal to distance divided by rate. Agreed? And for this, for so time would be distance divided by rate and what is the distance from A to B? What did I call it? D1. And what is D1 equal to? The square root of X squared plus 16 divided by, what was it rate? What was its rate when she was going from A to B there? Divided by 3 for that 3 miles per hour. And that is my answer for that part. It's distance divided by rate. The distance of this leg divided by its rate from the Pythagorean theorem. Part B, express the time it takes to walk from B to C at 5 miles per hour in terms of X. Well, di time is equal to distance divided by rate, but this was the rate 1 for the first leg of the distance. This is the distance divided by the rate 2 for the second leg of the distance. What was the second leg of this distance? This distance right here. What was that distance, D2? What was it equal to? You told me 5 minus X. Divided by how fast was she going there? Five miles an hour. That's what we're looking for there. But now they want this. So they tried to help you build this equation. But now you need total time. So how long did it take to do the whole trip? Well, the total time will be the time T1 plus the time T2. So this will be T1 plus T2 which will be the square root of x squared plus 16 divided by 3 plus 5 minus x divided by 5. Does that make sense? All I did was have my two distances together. That's the total distance of the trip. Or my time for the first and time for the second one. I had my two times together for the total time of the trip. Does that make sense? I lose you guys anywhere. But now we finally 
So you had to build the equation. Welcome to calculus at its best. You had to build your own equations and stuff. So now, use calculus. Hint, hint, hint. Don't graph it on your calculator and figure it out. Use calculus to find the value of x that minimizes the total trip time in part C and show your work. We want to figure out how far down the road she needs to go to for her point so she can minimize her time to making this leg of this trip. How do you maximize or minimize anything? What are you going to do? A derivative set equals zero and solve. Welcome back to calculus one. So my total time, I'll call it big T, is equal to, cleaning it up, x squared plus 16 to the one-half power divided by 3 plus 5 minus x divided by 5. Now, I'm going to take root of this guy, set him equal to zero and solve. Now, this is where a lot of folks completely fumble the ball out because you forgot to do the one of the most important things, John's femoral calculus. What's John's femoral calculus? Clean it up first. Don't just jump in both feet and start taking derivative. Can you clean this guy up? You bet. I would do this. You're dividing by a constant here. Dividing by three, you can pull constants out front, but it will show up as a what? A fraction, one-third times x squared plus 16 to the one-half power. It'll be a lot easier to take rid of that guy. But more importantly, this dude here. I'm dividing by a single term in terms of two terms. I can take that single term and put it under each one. 5 over 5 minus x over 5. And what's 5 divided by 5? That's just 1, right? So I cleaned it up now. Less chance for make a careless error when I take my derivative set equal zero and solve. So here I go. T prime. The derivative of this thing is, well, chain rule on this first part. Take the one-half out front. That'll be one-third times one-half x squared plus 16 raised to the what? Negative one-half chain rule. Derivative the outside. Inside stays the same time. Derivative the inside, which is 2x plus, and this is for your benefit, what's derivative of one Zero minus, what's the rate of x over 5 or otherwise known as 1 fifth x? 1 fifth. Does that make sense? I'm going to set it equal to 0 and I'm going to solve, but before I do that, I'm going to clean it up some more. What is uh, 3 times 2? 6 times that 2. Well, that 2 cancels with that 2. So I'm left with, this is a neg negative x when it goes in the bottom. So this will be x over, that <laughs> x stays on top, over 3 times the square root of x squared plus 16 minus 1 fifth equals 0. Does that make sense? Because here's my cleaned up derivative if you think about it. Have I lost anywhere? Yeah. Explain that whole combining all the terms that went up. I didn't understand. Okay. I get that you got 1 sixth and then that's not wrong. Okay. Well, I, put, I called this 1 sixth, but then I saw I had a 2x up here. So strict multiplication division, things cancel. 2x on top, 2 on the bottom, what happens to the 2s? Cancel. So I cancel the 2s. Still leaves with a 3 down there. This is a negative exponent. Negative exponents go where? The bottom. On the bottom. Half a power is a what? So it's a square root on the bottom. So I got the square root of x squared plus 16 on the bottom. This x is the only thing left on top, and there she is. Okay? And that was 0 and 1 fifth. I just left it there. Now I'm going to solve for x. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to move the 1 fifth to the other side. So this is x divided by 3 square roots of x squared plus 16 equals 1 fifth. Now, from an algebra perspective, what are you going to do to solve for x on this thing? I'm going to cross multiply. Multiply by your common denominator if you want to, or cross multiply. It's the same effect. That will be multiplying by 15 times the square root of x squared plus 16. But you really get this cross multiplication bit. This is going to give you 5 times x is equal to 3 square roots of x squared plus 16 officially times 1. All right, more algebra here. Running out of room, but that's okay. What am I going to do? I'm going to solve for x. How am I going to solve for x? I'm going to get rid of my square root. What gets rid of a square root? Square. I'm going to square both sides. But be careful when squaring both sides. What is 5x quantity squared, also known as? 25x squared equals, don't forget, you've got to square the 3. What's 3 squared? 9 times the square root squared cancels. That leaves you with just the x squared plus 16. Does that make sense? So I would distribute 
this is going to give me 25x squared equals 9x squared plus 16. I'm going to subtract 9x squared from both sides. And what is 25x squared minus 9x squared? Oh, I did. Oh, I forgot that. Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, I had to distribute. Now I'm just trying to uh, catch up. You're right. I got to distribute here. And 9 times 16, careless error here. 9 times 16 is 144. Thank you. That's a 144. Thank you. Distribute. I'm going to subtract 9x squared from both sides. And what's that going to give me? 25x squared minus 9x squared is what? 16x squared equals 144. What am I going to do now? Divided by 16 on both sides. They work real hard on this problem. X squared is equal to 144 divided by 16 is a whopping 9. And now I'm going to take the what? Square root of both sides. And what do I get for X? Now officially it's plus or minus 3, but X represents a distance down the road that you're going. So what is the answer? Three or she needs to go three miles down the road. X is equal to three. Does that make sense? Did I lose you guys anywhere on this one? All right. Before you guys leave, would you guys like to know the statistics on this particular exam? How it, you, how you would have done compared to everybody else? All right. What do you think the class average on this particular exam? What do you think it was? Sixty-six, I believe it was. That is well, let me explain why. You see this last problem right here? People looked at this problem and didn't know what to do. So what did they do when you don't know what to do? They left it blank. Well, that was easy to grade, but that's just 12 points they just lost right there. You understand, and it just dictated off of that. So you know something, write something down. Don't let this be the only exam you guys cover. Also, don't forget to go back and do the course evaluations. On my class, I put the little link up there. You just have to copy and post it to a link. But do the course evaluations and tell the administration what you think about making these videos and stuff. And I'll see you guys tomorrow at 730.